Good morning, good morning. We are super excited to be back again for a, another segment of the Comerica Business Bootcamp Sense series. And again, we're just super excited to be here. I'm pretty sure I've said that for the last six, seven, however many times we've been here now. Um, but again, I just get more and more excited every conversation we have because it's really a deeper dive into these conversations um, that's gonna help business owners in the nonprofit space and the for-profit space, as well as individuals who navigate the corporate world to really get clear on a number of things. And so we just wanna take a moment. If you're new to us, welcome. If you've been here before and you're a veteran of the bootcamp series, hey, um, we just wanted to, again, welcome you here. We realize that COVID has affected communities across the globe. And so Comerica and I decided to put together these 12 bi-weekly workshops, which are designed for nonprofit founders, professional pro service providers, and corporate leaders to remain proactive in increasing their knowledge and developing their skills as we navigate this post-COVID world together. And I am your host, A. Margot Blair. I'm the founder of Discover Her Worldwide and a partnership strategist. Discover Her's mission is, to, is designed to bridge uh, generational gaps between diverse groups of women. And pre-Rona, we would do this through in-person, professional, and personal development experiences, such as conferences, trainings, and seminars. And as we navigate this post-COVID world at Discover Her, we're finding inter interesting ways to cultivate virtual experiences such as these in order to be uh, able to continue to teach the fundamentals that may have been missed um, equip actionable steps that you can apply to your business and life right now, as well as grow our networks. And so before we get started, I just wanted to go over housekeeping like we usually do. And um, we have a, a really solid crew today joining us and we get to talk to our sponsors at Comerica. We have three great representatives who are gonna be sharing um, some, some, intang some intangible wisdom with us today. And so again, just wanted to take us a moment to go over some housekeeping details. So per usual, Summer and Stacy, get ready because we are going to tell them to go ahead and snap a photo for us. And they can go ahead and uh, put that over on a, so their preferred social media platform. And remember, when you go ahead and post any comments, any pictures, you want to make sure to use the hashtag Comerica Business Sense Bootcamp Series. What that allows us to do is go back once we're done with this um, training and just see what your major takeaway was. Um, and we can begin to continue to share that and encourage other people to join us for the next sec several segments. So per usual, go ahead and grab your notepad and pen if you haven't done so already. And again, share with your network. So again, before we dive all the way in, I just wanted to take a, another brief moment to just thank Comerica for seeing the vision and just really joining us to bring this training to life. And so I wanna introduce you to Summer and I'll, I'll have her share a little bit about who she is and, and why she decided to join us um, in this vision. So Summer, thank you so much for joining us. How are thank you? Thank you so much, Marco. I'm good, thank you. How's everyone else? Um, we're excited to be here, Comerica Bank. Uh, we we want to kind of dive into the community, and that's the reason why we set up these programs and these workshops. I mean, you can never have enough financial education, financial literacy. It is not just because it wasn't taught, but it's because things are changing at, at larger and faster paces and speeds, and we have to kind of keep up with the environment that we're all in. So, continual education on your day-to-day, -day, whether it's business or personal or your your children or just kind of to see how to, to navigate this world that we live in is helpful to have resources. And that's where we kind of walked in and, and spoke with Marco about it. We want to see how how our community is doing. Do they are they keeping up with the pace of the banks? Are they keeping up with the pace with the CDFIs or the 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 different resource um, areas that are out there? We want to provide that content so that when people are ready to whether it's to get a loan or to set up a bank account or or whatever it might be, start your business. Are you in the place where you can do so? Have you taken those necessary steps or? Is it saying, you know what, I need to know what I need to do to set up my business in six months or a year, or these are my these are my goals, this is my vision. Does this match the intent of the bank? So that's what we're here for today. We want to kind of kind of preset everything, answer all questions, um, small, large, whether it's make makes sense to you or not. We want to answer those questions, get rid of any myths, 
and make sure that everyone's on the right track to be successful in their business or in their future business that they're, they're looking to accomplish. So thank you so much, Margo, for allowing us to be here. We're extremely excited. Uh, I love working with Discover Her Worldwide, and this is certainly not our first time, and it won't be our last time working with you, so thank you. Um, but I am excited excited about our speaker today, Stacey Mixon, and I'll tell a little bit about Stacey. Stacey's one of our, uh, most, she's one of our most talented uh, managers. She's been in this industry for so long. She knows so much information. She's going to be able to give you so much information that you're just like, okay, I didn't even know that it had, you know, there, there was, it was so in depth. It, it's just so much information she has. And she, she, she doesn't look like she's been in the business this long, but <laughs> she has, and she will shock you with some of the easiest ways of making sure that you're in line for, for what you want. So that is the, the good thing. Stacey is the vice president of retail banking here in Arizona. She manages the downtown branch and uh, she will be able to answer all, all wonderful questions for you. Um, and I'll be here too, but I like to sit in the background and just kind of pop in whenever, <laughs> but I was, I'm going to let Stacey handle it. And then we also have Cam. Pam is our SBA lender. She is absolutely amazing here in Arizona. She does the lending portion. So Stacey handles everything business related, everything you need. She's your, your, your kind of your, your one-stop shop. But Pam is kind of specialized when it comes to what you want for lending. So uh, you have a lot of varieties and different levels of banking right here. And you can get all of your, your questions answered in this, this, this one hour period. And honestly, to get everybody in the room at the same time to ask these questions, it typically is like a 30 day wait to, <laughs> to try to get everybody's schedules to align. So um, have fun, enjoy everything you need and let us know what, what you have. So I'll give it back to you, Margo, and then you can lead us on and tell us what we need to do next. Absolutely. So again, thank you so much, Summer. Stacy. thank you so much. Pam, thank you so much. Um, and you'll probably hear me say that a couple times throughout this because Summer, just to um, reiterate what you shared, this is not common to not only have um, these levels of individuals in the same room, but for one hour, almost 90 minutes, we're gonna be here to answer any questions that you have. And so um, we always encourage the people when they're registering to join us to submit questions in advance. And so we have some really good questions for you ladies um, that we're gonna be talking about. But then also we just wanna to continue to encourage for those of you who are um, catching this live on Facebook, YouTube um, or Instagram, we wanna make sure that you are submitting your questions to us so that we can um, really support you along your journey and so that you are really prepared for your development and your growth for your own business. And so real quick, Stacey, um, I'm going to jump over to you too, Pam, but Stacey, can you just um, go ahead and introduce yourself, share a little bit about your background, um, and then we'll dive in after um, we introduce both you and Pam. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Stacey Nixon. I'm with Comerica Bank. I've been at Comerica Bank now for about two years. But I've been in the banking industry for, believe it or not, I think going on 22 years now. Um, for most of my banking career, I have been in the management field. I started as a, I started as a full-time teller. And from a full-time teller, I went on over to an assistant branch manager and then to a banking center manager. So my entire career has been in the management, has been dealing, have hands-on with the business community as well, because that's a huge job as far as being a banking center manager. We partner with our bank with our small business bankers such as Pam and we get out there in the community and help them. As far as me, I've just, I love it. That's why I've been doing it for as long as I have been. And like Summer said, it's just something that some people are just good at it. I'm that people person and I love getting back to the community and I also love helping businesses. I've helped businesses from the ground up from where you can have them where they come into the banking center and where we have to pass them over to our commercial banking. So I just love helping my businesses and, and giving back to the community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stacey, again, and welcome um, to the series. Miss Pam, you. how are you? Can you do the same and tell us a little bit about you, um, just so people can get uh, just a better understanding and to prepare for the questions that they're going to be presenting to you. Good morning, Margo. Thank you for allowing me to join you guys this morning. I started in banking back in 2002. And I was a banker and kind of did my little steps through the banking process and went off for a while and did hard money, alternative finance, and then joined Comerica a couple years ago. So I've seen many forms of financing and I just love traditional banking and, 
and thanks so much of the team that I work with here at Comerica Bank. So I'm going to be here to answer questions about, you know, in preparing yourself for coming and talking to your relationship manager about borrowing needs and then supporting uh, the rest of my Comerica team to help answer questions. But I love what I do. And to Stacy's point, building up the community and working with our business owners is what absolutely excites all of us. Thank you. Thank you both. So we're just going to go dive in. As I said, we had some questions um, from the very beginning. So just to reiterate, if you're just coming on, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are here discussing the fundamentals of finance. Today's conversation is really, really heavy on finances, business finances. We're going to talk a little bit about financial analysis, how to really begin to conduct that for your own business. But then too, on a fundamental level, we know that we're in the game of making business while making impacts, right? So we don't even have to be shy about that. But we know for many of you who are the business owners, whether you're a solopreneur, whether you have a team, you are the CEO of your organization. And so I just want to make sure that we're also having a conversation around having a healthy relationship and mindset with money. And so let's just dive in there. Um, Stacy, Pam, uh, we'll start with you, Stacy. Can you just talk about how do you have a healthy relationship with money? Having a healthy relationship with money is base, getting down to basics, understanding it. A lot of people just think they have it. And when they have it, they can just do whatever they want to do with it. But that's not having a healthy relationship with money. Having your healthy relationship is you have to have different pots. You have to have, you know, your, for example, on a business, you have to have your payroll set up. You have to have your maybe some expenses set up. You have to have different things to work with your business and not just all have it in one pot. Also understanding what's going in, what's coming out. And that's also having a great understanding, not commingling when it comes to the business side, not commingling your personal funds with your business funds. That's also having that healthy relationship with those funds. Oh, that's good. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Pam, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think Stacy did a good job because as you were proposing the question, I was thinking to myself, how was I going to answer that? And very much along the lines of what Stacy said, it's really budgeting yep. and, and understanding what creates money. Is it time? Is it labor? How are you using the resources to create money? Mm -hmm. And or behind that is budgeting and planning and surrounding yourself with a team of professionals to help you best recognize what resources you have and that we all are future planning with you as a business owner to best use those resources that you have. That's, that's really good. Um, just two points that, that, you, that both of you shared there is really understanding the conversation around budgeting. Um, for, for Summer, she can speak to this, but we've been having the conversation. We've had six conversations so far um, around the fundamentals, right? And one of those conversations that came up was budgeting and really putting yourself in a good position to really understand what those expenses are that are coming out, but then also forecasting for what's coming in and making sure that you are in alignment, right? Because again, um, some of the individuals that we have in here, um, we started having the conversation on the importance of what does it look like to, to really begin implementing your operational budget. And if you don't have an operational budget, you're really in a, in a difficult position as a business owner. And so can we just talk a little bit more about that, ladies? Can we just go deeper into the, the importance of um, um, really understanding and managing um, a budget effectively? You want to start, Pam, or you want me to start? I'll start this time. I think what's important is when we have this type of live audience, everybody is perhaps at a different stage of what this is. Anywhere from someone considering to start a business to maybe individuals who have been in business for years and they are beginning to exit plan, right? That there's life stages in a business and within those different stages, there's kind of different motivations to use your cash. And so a startup is going to be someone who is perhaps leaning towards, if not self-funding, uh, kind of the old adage, we kiddingly say friends, family and fools, the three Fs, but 
you, you have to have a budget in advance of starting. You don't just get to wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to run out and make widgets. Well, there's steps to starting to make widgets or provide your services. So that's key again in that budgeting that we've talked about. Having a mentor, who else is in that same industry that you're getting into? Share with me what were your experiences? What tripped you up at the beginning? So I, I think again that relying on your community of professionals and other entrepreneurs like yourself are really gonna help you get started. And as your company grows, you're going to change and shift. And now you might be ready for, for lending and coming in and working with someone like myself, in addition to Stacy, who's been there from the get-go, right? Because as soon as you get started, you establish an EIN number, hey, you need a banking account, right? So you are constantly through the entire cycle working with a banker so they best understand what it is that you need. Stacy, all you. I couldn't agree more with you. Um, when it comes to having the mentor, not only with the mentor, use your banker as your mentor as well. Ask them what challenges they may have seen. Of course, you know we're not the professionals in that industry, but we're the professionals in our industry. So we're able to help you, we're able to guide you towards other resources we may have. Like for example, I know some may know other resources or have other resources so I can guide them to Summer and say, hey, you can go to Summer, she can link you up with that person. Another thing I say to listen to your bankers, we are there to help you. We're there to help and guide you. A lot of people have that false perception that we're trying to sell you something. And in essence, we're not. We're trying to help you for what's best for your business and exactly what Pam said. And then once you get past your basic fundamentals of banking, that's when you're gonna get onto Pam. But what we're trying to do is put you on the right track so you're able to get to Pam. That's really good. Uh, Stacey, you mentioned um, a myth, right? One of the myths is that bankers, banking, banks are trying to always sell us something. Um, ladies, what are, would you say, the top three myths um, that people, that business owners should be aware of when, when it comes to business banking? Top three. Yeah. Help with this one, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I think sometimes... And this goes back decades, right? Banking was a man's world. Bankers are intimidating. It's, they're just going to tell me no. And, and really, that's not true. Um, we are a support system for helping you look over where you want to be. So much more um, advisory role. And that's changed in time. Um, and certainly... As you see on this panel, women in banking have actually just skyrocketed. And so I think that if you can find a banker that you feel like you can have honest communication and whether that's why you bounced a check, right? Because at the end of the day, that's, you know, I bounced a check because this happened and this happened and this happened. And if we know the story, I think we're going to be able to support you a little bit more. Um, other myths. You can get loans. I mean, I helped a client last year who had been turned down by one of the bigger banks and said to me, no, I'm not going to bother to get you your paperwork. And I kind of had to beg him and, and beg him. And finally, I got the paperwork and I gave him the loan. So just, you know, you may hear a no, but just one bank saying no doesn't mean they're all going to say no. Um, that perhaps would be another myth. I'm going to stop there. That's Stacy. you kind of see another side. What else? The myth that I hear a lot when I do ask small business owners, how come they don't have a business account? They always say the banks are trying to take their money. And that's not true because I know with Comerica, we actually have free checking accounts. So it's just seeing what's your best fit for you. Another myth is also a lot of people don't know about small business, the credit card side. They think, well, my business, I've only been in business for X amount of months. I can't get a credit card. That's a myth because we can help you get that credit card. Um, what other myths do I hear? There's so many of them, but sometimes we just have such a good comeback. We're like, no, 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 that's not true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Summer, what do you have there? What have you heard? 
Um, I do hear a lot of people saying that they would prefer to do everything online because there's no point in going into the branch or they think it's a waste of their time. I would really love for you guys to kind of touch on, especially you, Stacey, to touch on the reason why it's so important to, I mean, utilize the online items, but why the importance of in-person communication with your banker? Um, can you kind of divulge into, into why that's important? Yes, actually, um, the importance is because you get to know your banker. When you come into the banking center, we understand you, we see your transactions. If something is out of the norm, we're able to give you a call. You know them, you have that personal relationship with the banker. I know Summer and I, we talked about this when it came to the PPP loans. I have heard so many people discuss those and tell me they couldn't get one. And my first question that I asked them, do you have a relationship with your banker? And many of them said no. And the reason I did ask that question is because I know here at Comerica, we took pride and we called our customers and we let them know the process. We let them know how they, how we could help them, how um, even Pam was on the phone talking to customers, but we have that relationship. And that's where it's important that you do come in the banking center and you discuss your banking needs with your banker and you get to have that relationship because when something happens, you're able to pick up the phone and call us and we're able to get it done. Those were really solid points. And just, again, just to, to ride on that same wave. One of the things that I want to stress too, this is something that I talk about with my own bankers. Um, we, we have, for the, the different businesses, we have separate, separate accounts, but it's really important that you're also able to be comfortable expressing and addressing issues with your banker and, and having that specific banker rather than on the main line and having to tell 67 people to somebody else that is the importance of being able to have that direct relationship and so i just want to take a second um to see i want to take a second to see if anybody has questions um regarding that or what challenges have you faced when it comes to working with a, with a banker or honestly, I just wanna see a show of hands. You can go ahead and post in the comment section. Do you have a current relationship with your banker? Yes or no? That's, you know, so that's a really important question that we ask right now. Um, we encourage you to go ahead and do so, but we just wanna see, for those of you who are joining us here on Zoom, on Facebook, go ahead and just post in the comment section. We're already seeing a couple no's. We're seeing several no's. So yes, so that, that thank you ladies for that point. Just to make sure that you're going ahead and establishing a relationship with the banker. And if you haven't done so just yet, Go ahead and just call what, wherever your closest branch is. Go, um, go ahead and make that call and, and establish the relationship. And if you don't feel like that particular person is a good fit, you can feel free to continue to ask other people. Um, so mm -hmm. that's just something that I that I want to make sure that that we touched on too. Um, can I add to that too? Yeah, please go ahead. Answer our calls. That that one is huge. Is answer our calls. A lot of people. There's been so many times where we're calling our existing customers and they just don't want to talk to us. Again, they think we're selling something. Well, we're probably not. We're just checking on them, making sure it's okay, seeing if there's something we can help them with. And, and that's huge because those are conversations I've had one off, even with friends that are business owners. And that's the first thing I ask. Do you answer the calls? No, answer the calls when your bank is calling because we're not calling to sell, sell you something. We're calling to check in on you and establish that relationship with you. Good, very solid. That's super essential. So let's go ahead and dive a little bit deeper. It still may be a fundamental question, but again, we're seeing some no's that people don't have a relationship with a banker. So ladies, what is, what is your role as my banker? Like, how do we approach that conversation? What is your role as a banker? It's a two part, but I'll, I'll go ahead and ask the second question um, as well, just so you can put it all together. What is my role as a business owner and a customer? So that's the two pieces of it. What's your role as my banker, but then what's my role as a business owner? Can I start, Stacy? Yes, please. Okay. So Stacy is is the banker who holds the relationship, and my role is helping you get money to borrow for lines of credit, owner occupied real estate be a vehicle, equipment, whatever your borrowing need is, I'm your advocate to underwriting, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the champion of knowing your story 
Why do you need the money? What's the history been look like? Why do your financials reflect what they do? So I'm kind of who you use as your voice in front of our underwriting team to help you get the loan. Now, if Stacy and I have an opportunity to work with you, perhaps a year or so before you get the loan, then I'm gonna say, okay, here's what we're looking for, right? Um, how's your spending here? What's happening here? It's, it's about cash flow. But really my goal and my role is to get you the loan by being your advocate. So, but Stacy, she's your banker. She's the key or the glue to building that financial relationship with Comerica. So with that being said, uh, when she says I'm your banker, I'm the first person you may see when you come in to open an account. So I will open your account. After I open your account, there's a follow-up process. You know, once I open up the account, I follow up with you. If there's anything else we can do. Let me take that back, actually. During the opening process, there's a series of questions that we may, some bankers may ask, some bankers may not ask. We may follow up and ask those questions. When we're asking those questions, that's when we're having a deeper dive with you and your business to see how I can help you. And as your banker, that's where we're the key person. We're the person when you're telling us what, what you, your goal is, what you want to achieve. The whole time we're listening to you, our wills are spending. Our wills are spending to say, okay, I have a person for that. So I might grab Pam for that. Or I have, um, let's say you have questions about some, uh, some, something about our treasury management. Well, I have a department for that. So, but I am still your key person when you need those type of things. So you still come to your banker for those things and then we get those other people involved. So if you need a credit card, that's us. If you have a, a, a account, if you have questions regarding a check that may have bounced, that's your banker. If you have questions about why you got charges on an account, that's your banker. If you wanna um, talk to about, um, like I said, Pam, about lending, you come to me first, I ask the serious questions, we get you in front of Pam that's your banker. So you go through your banker for everything and then we get you to the proper people. Thank you ladies for that insight. That's great. I wanna ask um, a few questions that we got from, um, from our participants. Why is it important for my banker and I to have a relationship and plan long-term goals? Uh any business would want to be planning long-term goals. Right. Maybe they aren't always just financial long-term goals. Mm -hmm. um, it's projecting. I think that through this COVID experience, we've all learned projecting five years out maybe isn't realistic <laughs> any longer. Um, maybe you have a six month plan, a year plan, an 18 month, but you do somewhere in the business as you're growing, be adaptable to that long-term plan. So if you perhaps, again, the best example that I see is a lot of CPAs, either based off of because the business owner has said, hey, this is, I don't want to pay Uncle Sam, right? Use as many deductions as you can. I don't want to show much income. Therefore, you know, I'm going to run all my personal expenses through the business and the whole bit. And so you end up with either maybe a small net loss or a very small profit where, you know, in actuality, you really made a lot more than that. But then you come to me and you say, hey, wait, lend me money. I, I don't know how you strategized. All I see is financial documents that show me they lost money or they didn't make enough money to be able to make this loan payment. So that's, again, why having a direction or a planning for your business overall helps by working with a banker to say, what does my bank require of me to be able to get a loan? What does my credit score need to look like? What kind of debts can I already previously have? What do I need to pay off? So things like that would be a good reason to be working with your banker. I would also say, um, if you're talking about a long-term goal, as far as do you want to expand your business? Do you want to sell your business in the future? What, when do you want to, do you want your, do you want to give your business to your children? That's where you sit down and you talk to us because we also have not only, like I said, we have Pam, we have financial planners as well. 
So do you have money set aside for you to retire at a certain time? Do you plan on buying a building? Do you have that in order for you to meet with Pam so you can buy that building? So that's why it's very important to you for you to sit down with your banker and have that long-term goal because it's whatever your long-term goal wants to be. Thank you, ladies. Great, great points. Um, to, to follow up um, with a point that you mentioned, Stacey, but I'm going to give the question to you, Pam. One of the questions is the long-term goal, specifically building um, or buying a building or purchasing a building of some sort. Pam, when should we position ourselves to come to you? When we're ready to buy the building tomorrow, six months before, a year before, when should we come to you and what do we need? Well, I think that's going to vary based on what you're borrowing. Um, now, in your example, as far as owner-occupied real estate, perhaps you have explored the market. We're definitely going to see a change in the commercial marketplace right now because of COVID. A lot of empty spaces are going to become available. So if you're looking for something along the lines of a great opportunity right now and you right now well give it a couple more months right. <laughs> it's coming it's definitely coming um so you want to keep in mind to that we need 20 percent down of cash influx on your part so that might affect the price range at which you're going to go buy understand uh what type of program are you looking for an sba loan are you looking for traditional loan. Uh, that'll make some differences in the route that you go. So how far in advance? You might be growing so quickly that literally you wake up one morning and you recognize the fact I need a new truck. I, I can't deliver in my car anymore. So again, as part of your planning, have you been saving? Now you might need a small bit to put down for that vehicle or that equipment or, or whatever it is. But can some lending needs truly pop up very quickly? Sure they can, sure they can. Now, a line of credit is different than a term loan. So those two examples were about term loans. A line of credit is, I describe it as a great big old credit card in a way with ridiculously low rates as compared to a credit card. So a line of credit is something which will help you grow your cash flow. And there's a way of turning or using, paying back, revolving it, that a line can actually help you grow your business. So that might be one of the first things to start. But I think Stacy could do a little bit more about if you are getting started talking about business credit cards. How do you just even begin to establish business credit? So when it comes to the business credit cards, there's been the myth, again, that they have to be in business for two years, three years, but that's not the case when it comes to a business credit card. All you do is apply. A business credit card, we're using your personal credit, and as long as you have some good personal credit, the, the chances are very high that you would get approved, and that will start reporting towards your business credit. Again, um, it's just people won't do it because they don't think they can. So that's the, that's the first thing to start is to, to try to get a business credit card. If not, we also have secured, secured cards for businesses as well. So if your credit isn't that stable, we can help you with a secured business credit card. And that can also put you on that path to increase your credit. So you have that credit worthiness when the opportunity does come for you to purchase a building or for you to purchase equipment. Stacey, you mentioned the secure line. Just to talk about that, I got I got a comment that says yes. So I think somebody may not have the best credit, which yes, right. There's always room for growth. Um, so just can you talk a little bit about that when you mentioned um, that that secure that secure credit card does that also go and affect your personal credit and help that increase as well, or is that yes. separate? Can you talk a little bit more deeply about that? It's underneath your social, so it does does report underneath the credit, under your personal credit. So with how it works here at Comerica Bank, there's a minimum that we deposit into what goes into an actual CD and that backs the credit card. So if you're approved, so whatever, like let's say um, I've had someone put in $2,000. They put $2,000 in, they were approved. Their limit is now what they put in. So that's their limit. As long, and you just consider yourself, it's paying, you're paying yourself back 
So once you use it, you're paying yourself back and it's getting reported to the credit bureau. So that's how simple a, a, a secured card is. And it will help your business credit along with your personal credit. And Stacy, in reference to you just mentioning that your business and your personal credit, look at both. Lenders do look to both. So even though you might bring me, say, tax returns that, boy, you just made so much profit and you're doing great and the whole bit. But over on the family side, mm -hmm. you know, you we're spending a little bit too much or we've neglected some bills and your credit score up to where it should be, which in my case, I'm looking for a credit score of 640. Um, that it, it shows still how to use money is reflected in a credit score. So we want to be sure that it's all in line. So even if the business is doing well, that personal credit score still needs to line up with that taking care of bills and taking care of finances. Good stuff, great stuff, ladies. Um, another question came in and um, I'm not sure if she's on right now, but hopefully if we need clarity, then then you ladies can answer this. But should nonprofits, con sh should nonprofits consider setting up investment for long-term planning? Should nonprofits consider setting up investments for long-term planning? Well, I would say yes, because it's a nonprofit, I understand it is nonprofit, but they're also still a business. So just like any business owner would want to, they will have one-off rare occurrences that pop up that they need to have savings for. Um, so yes, I mean, I would make that suggestion. So you guys, this is Pam, this is Pam's first time with us, and she knows exactly what we've been talking about. Nonprofits should be profitable. So yes, you do. You should make sure that you are in position, in, as the same way that if this were a personal conversation, you want to make sure you have that cushion for the unexpected of expenses when they arise. Not if, right? People talk about saving for a rainy day. You don't want that rainy day to come. So you want to make sure you you are prepared in position and that you're able to be agile if something unexpected happens. And that also goes back to having a good relationship with your banker. Go ahead, Stacey. It looks like you want to add something to it. No, I don't. Okay. Summer, Pam said it all, unless Summer has anything to add, because I know Summer is very familiar with nonprofits. I am, and we've discussed this several times, ladies. I mean, it's one of those things. A business is a business is a business. As a lender, and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, we're not going to look at your nonprofit and say, oh, it's a nonprofit. So you have a different set of qualifications. No, ma'am, you are going to get the exact same set of qualifications as a regular business is, no matter who you claim to be. The only difference will show on your taxes. But when it comes to your assets, because uh, as a bank, and just like I said this before, we are investing in your business. So if your business doesn't look like it's a good investment, no matter which way you look at it, we're not going to invest. So you have to provide yourself as a good business for a bank to invest in. And so that's why the big thing when we discussed before was making sure that you get those lines of credit, that you come to the bank. And if you're not ready for that line of credit or for that loan, get to a position where you are. Ask the bank, how can I be successful in my business to where you want to lend to me? They'll give you those qualifications or those tiers and they'll work you through it. So that's the best thing about working with Stacy, and then also starting to work with Pam as well, because just because you're not ready to buy that building or buy that automobile, doesn't mean that you're not going to position yourself after a busy season or after your, your CPA might just take another look at your taxes and, and make sure all those resources fall in line. So definitely invest, definitely treat your, your nonprofit as a regular business. If you don't know how, this is where you come into get in front of Stacy. Like I need your time, like right now, can we schedule something so you can kind of put me on the right path on how I need to make sure my business is in line with what the bank wants and with what the, and then speak with your CPA and make sure you're in line with what the government wants too. This is a little bit of a different comment. We haven't necessarily touched on it yet, but as I'm sitting here thinking about it, business owners will start getting a tremendous amount of calls from predatory lenders. Mm -hmm. Individuals that have alternative finance options 
at rates that they don't present as well in black and white as what they end up being. Please try to avoid falling into that trap. If you are there and you're desperately looking for money, meet with Stacy, meet with the banker and discuss, hey, I'm getting this call. This is what they're proposing. Does this make sense? Why would I ever do this? But um, if it sounds too good to be true, I assure you they are. And I know you get inundated with those calls. Just uh, there is such a thing, even not just at the consumer level, but at the business level for predatory lending. Several really great points here. And per usual, I'll go ahead and put myself on the chopping block and tell a little personal story. Um, because again, we want this these points to, to hit home. We won't do, we don't want them to be over your head. We want you to understand that even if you haven't experienced this yet or you didn't know what questions to ask during this conversation, you still have the opportunity to ask questions. We're gonna be here for a, a while longer. So go ahead and, 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 and drop those questions in. But just to share a personal story, um, Summer mentioned the importance of, of making sure that you're in a great position, having the, you know, being able to ask those questions or knowing what questions to ask, what have you. Um, I want to share that at, at, at a really early stage in my business, I didn't have, whether it was my credit or um, whether it was really not understanding my numbers. We had that conversation, the last um, Comerica series, where it was the importance of knowing the story behind your numbers. I didn't know what my numbers meant. I didn't know how to really leverage a relationship with my bank or my bank simply because I didn't know the story my numbers were telling me. And so what I mean by this is I have been in business since 2013. I have two separate businesses. And so I really didn't want, know how to not blur the lines between the two. Here's a nonprofit, here's a for-profit. But also I really didn't even know how to communicate what my needs were with the nonprofit versus with the for-profit. And so when I started learning where my, you know, where I was gapped, what my needs were, I also took it a step further and really got to know my numbers and what those numbers meant. And so we'll talk about your impact statement, the impact you're making for those of you who are nonprofits or um, you serve a number of clients in, a, in the um, professional service industry. Um, I want you to really hear me out when I'm talking about this. Your impact are the people that you serve oftentimes. And when you wanna go and reach out to um, another business or a bank for additional support with it, with what you're doing, you have to be able to present that impact and you want to be able to show the history that you have been making that impact but again it's if you're new to the business it's not that you have to wait as stacy said for two years or three years or five years you want to go ahead and put yourself in position now sharing hey this is our vision this is where we want to go can you or how can you support me along my journey and so again i'm sharing my personal experience I didn't do that. And so I had to really work harder um, year five, year six, honestly, um, just over the last two years where I was really starting to partner with other banks, not just Comerica, but several other banks as well um, and other financial in financial institutions. And so where, whether your goal is to partner with a financial institution as a nonprofit or to do business with a financial institution as a for-profit, that's not the conversation. It's the conversation is really making sure that you are um, having, uh, establishing and maintaining a healthy relationship with the people who are here to support you and the people who can answer the questions that you need to be answered. And so we're gonna stop for a second um, just to give anybody the opportunity to go ahead and ask questions. We're gonna keep doing that because again, you won't, likely forget this opportunity to connect with these dynamic women um, to, to have these questions answered for you. So go ahead, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop those in there. But ladies, we have some more. So we'll keep going. Um, one question or another question that we had was um, business spending versus personal spending. Let's talk about the do's and don'ts. Don't shout. Don't commingle it. Look, don't commingle it. <laughs> Mic drop, we can go home, y'all. Don't miss. That's it. Just don't commingle it. You have a personal checking account for a reason. You have a business checking account for a reason. I see it all the time. I actually was out doing business calls yesterday. And for, there's a reason why Zelle does not go into business accounts. There's the reason why Cash App does not go into business accounts, because those are personal. So as soon 
anytime I talk to a business and like Zell me, so that tells me you don't have a business account. So you cannot commingle your funds because once you get to Pam, you know, Pam's going to ask some questions. And if you're giving her statements and everything's on the personal side, well, what did you do on your business side? You, you're, you're not commingling. And your CPA is going to not like you very much. <laughs> They're not going to like you because they have to differentiate the funds. Also, um, we can see it too when, when you're talking to us and we're looking at your account. And that's when you can tell when people are not budgeting because they're commingling their funds. They're using that debit card to use their everyday purchases. And most of the time, what I've seen is people that do that, their books are out of whack. Their books, their their um, their budgeting is not where it needs to be. Their, you know, they have a higher chance, a higher chance of them becoming negative in their account because they're not, they're not. Um, uh, what word am I looking for? They're not budgeting correctly. They're not, they're not using their accounts correctly. So the the mic drop. He says, don't commingle it. If you have a personal account, use your funds for personal. If you have to pay yourself, then write yourself a check. Pay yourself, and I'm sure your CPA will love you for that. <laughs> Pam or Summer? Now, I'm on the page with everything that you've mentioned so far, Stacy. Um, certainly, I think that when going back to not commingling, it will keep you from perhaps living above what your means are because if you're using the money from the business that was to be spent on the business, either winning another big bid or, and yet wait, you had to go buy something for the family over here. There's missed opportunities when you, when you mix it. Um, I was going to add one other point, Margo, when you were mentioning some other things, I think when you're having communication with your banker, understanding some terminology, basic terminology and knowing what, those terms, those financial terms mean, will help you. Um, accounts receivables, accounts payables. What are those? And what's the difference between the two? What is an income statement? What is a balance sheet? So just the word depreciation, understanding the different terminology. So again, if you're getting started and um, early stage, find a good solid resource to help you also become a familiar and knowledgeable in how to put together your finances and the terminology and things like that. It, I think those types of resources are a big help. I'll, I'll jump um, jump on that same um, same train, Pam. Uh, the the public library, um, and we have a question. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer hers in a second, but. Um, the public library is a great resource, um, especially when the budget is, uh, is, is low to get access to resources and support the public library specifically in Arizona. I know we have some people who are not local to Phoenix, hey, but um, your, your public library, your local library has resources for you to really dive in, take home, study through, but then there are also, um, business workshops, series of workshops that you can be part of. Um, and then SCORE. SCORE is a really great opportunity. Um, they have experienced business owners, um, individuals who are seasoned in the corporate space, who are coming back as mentors to other business owners, new um, and experienced business owners. So you can always reach out to those two resources. And I just wanted to add that, that point to what you're sharing, Pam. Um, we are going to go ahead and um, um, ask a question. Um, Sharika, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Oh, hey, Stacy. <laughs> hey, Sharika. Quick question. So I don't co-mingle monies because I, but there has been times and so best practices on, you know, there may be, okay, I need to, I need to buy it because of the situation I, I may not have the card or I may not feel comfortable using the checking card for this particular website so i pay for it and then i need to be reimbursed what is the best is a sim the best reimbursement uh software or invoice form or i'm not sure the quite the question but what is the best way when i need to be invoiced as a ceo to submit to the treasurer to be reimbursed like what type of documentation i guess Marama, have you answered that question, being a small business owner? 
You know what? I take everything to my CPA. So <laughs> anytime, <laughs> yeah, I just take yeah. all receipts and everything to my CPA. You pay them for a reason, have them figure it out <laughs> and they will figure it out for you. And then they'll tell you there, it, there might not be a form depending on who your CPA is, if they use QuickBooks or if they, or if they have a different uh, program that they utilize, but typically QuickBooks will have everything for you to kind of set you up to reimburse yourself for something. Um, but that also kind of falls in line with wanting to make sure you have a business credit card. Because if you're not comfortable with using your debit card to make those purchases online, definitely use that business credit card. It will protect you. And it has a few more protections than a, than a debit card will, will have. And I know Stacy can speak on that. Um, right. She probably has certain instances on how that, um, how that can save your life. But uh, if when in doubt, especially when it comes to reimbursements or how things need to look on your taxes, definitely speak with your tax advisor. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the credit card thing definitely has been on my mind more recently because of this space of COVID. And normally I would run to Walmart and get everything that I need, but it's now harder to get all the supplies. So definitely have been considering the credit card aspect as of because of COVID. <laughs> Well, come and see me. I think you still walk past me from time to time. <laughs> only on Mondays. <laughs> only on Mondays? <laughs> only on Mondays. <laughs> Short story about Sharika and I. We went to high school together. <laughs> I love that. I love how it yep. comes from <laughs> Small you know, world. It's yes. a big deal because that's literally where we were going to go next, Sharika. So you stole my question. Um, no, <laughs> you're good. But I think this is a really important conversation to have. And, and like I said, I'm really grateful that I have my experiences um, to share with other people so other people don't have to go through it. I did commingle in the beginning. Why? Because I started with my own finances, which a lot of business owners do. They don't mm -hmm. necessarily start with the business credit. They either have a gift from somebody who's like, hey, you want to start this business? Here you go. Here's 500. Here's 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, right? Whatever you start with. Um, but I had a really large amount and I was like, yeah, we about to get this work um, and I'm about to go into business, right? That was what I said. And I'll be honest with you, I was like, I'll pay it back when I start making money. I'll pay that mm -hmm. back when I start making money. I'll pay that back too. I'll pay that back later. And then I was like, oh, shoot. All right, now I got real expenses. Shoot, I forgot I didn't pay myself that. Okay, let me carry the one next time on the next bill. Mm -hmm. Oh, shoot, I never, I, I profited, but I haven't paid myself. So that's why this conversation is super super pivotal um, for wherever you are along your journey, again, because don't be like Marco. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> the reality is you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're upside down. Again, fortunately, I had some really great and people that I trust and say, hey, I think I did this the wrong way. Like, what do I do? Um, and yeah, some of them were um, financial representatives. Others were seasoned business owners who either did it themselves or they were like, hey, like, do not go past this limit. If you do, you need to reevaluate certain things. And, and that was the conversation. I ended up putting myself on very strict boundaries to where it's like, you are not tapping into your personal account. Like that's, that's you can't do that for a number of different reasons. And now we're in a better position. We don't use our personal account for business expenses. It just doesn't happen. And um, again, that's that's just a really important conversation to, to have. And it's why I teach a lot of my clients and my students, not all, a lot, all of my clients and students, the importance of budgeting and not even, not just budgeting, but creating an operational budget for your business. So you know, or it can at least prepare for what should be going out. And um, again, I always use this example as my conference. Um, for the conference, we had certain expenses, right? The venue, the people, resources, um, things that were coming, that were going to be um, given to the attendees, like swag bags and things of that nature, okay? So I put all of the expenses, every single cost, potential cost on that budget. But then we had the actual expenses. We had tons of sponsors. We had tons of in-kind donations. And so even though the swag bags were going to cost $500, we had them all donated. So it was a zero expense, but I still made sure to say, hey, we're going to plan for spending $500. We were great. And again, we turned a profit for that year for last year's conference simply because we were in position from the beginning. And so again, I will drive that point all the way home. Create your operational budget, 
create your operational budget and create your operational budget. And again, have these conversations with your bankers. And if any, and also, go ahead. Nope. And also when it comes to your bankers, as your business grows, your accounts, like you said, you have an operational budget. Most businesses have an operating account. Most businesses have a general account. Most businesses have a payroll account. With payroll accounts, that is imperative because on a payroll account, that's the only thing that's going out is just your payroll. Yep. So once you grow and you're, you have more people on your payroll, have a payroll account. You can catch fraud so easily because depending on how you're paying them, if something's out of whack, you know. And then we can shut that account down. We can open up a new account. It's not going to hurt the business as if you were just having everything go out your general account and you have a fraudulent check on your general account. We have to shut that account down. That's going to hurt because that's your day-to-day -day operations or it can be your operating account. You know, that's where you do talk to us and we explain why you have those accounts. When you first come in and open a business, I don't recommend you open up all these accounts because at that point you may or may not have service charges depending on where you're at in your business. But if it's just you and a partner, you're gonna start with just your general account and then go from there. So, so good. This is all so good. And I love how every conversation is seemingly flowing into some of the questions. Stacy, you already jumped to the next questions. Um, how can your business grow with you? Your bank, sorry, how can your bank grow with you? Just sitting down when you're talking to your, your banker. As your, one thing, I actually have a business and I watch them grow. And after I did the tour, I seen, I brought his accounts over to me and I'd seen that he had plenty of employees, but he did not have a payroll account. So I talked to him about a payroll account, explained the benefits on why to have a payroll account. Number one, like I told you the whole fraud and we opened up his payroll account. He just made a deposit every week. He did it online or he came in, made a deposit and that covered his payroll. And as his business grew, we talked about other things that we can help him with as a bank. As his business grew, his lending needs grew. And therefore, I talked to him, well, how are you getting past this? Or again, like Pam said, how are your accounts receivables? How are you getting paid? Are they paying you on time? And these are questions that I ask as a banker because once I go, they're telling me, well, this person's not paying me in time. So now I may have to start using this money that I had in my business savings account to pay this. Well, to me, there's a need. I need Pam to come in because you're growing, but we need you to have that, those funds there. You need some cash reserves and that's where I get Pam involved and we get the necessary lines of credit in place. Or you may have a need for, you can't come into the banking center anymore because you're so busy. You're a business, you're a business owner and you're just busy all the time. So you can't come in and make your deposits. There's different ways you're able to make your deposits. And we have other people come in and talk to you. And as long as you tell us your need as your banker, that's where we can grow with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that as well. I think that's a really big conversation because again, we're having this conversation about long-term planning, right? Future focus, taking, you know, intentional, intentional action steps to really be in position um, for that growth when it occurs. Not if, but when. Um, it, I, I'm, I'm sure we can answer this question. Let's go ahead and talk about this for a second. What business banking services do you need? You talked a little bit about the payroll, but um, Stacey, can you add to um, just providing that clarity? What are some uh, other banking services as a business owner and some if you can add um, for a nonprofit if there's different ones? Um, what are those services that we need on a, on a, a foundational level? Well, Comerica, we do offer payroll services. We branch out to another payroll company and then they tie it back in with us. But we also have, like, like I told you, we set up a payroll account. We have it where you can use our online banking services. Online banking services also have, I want to say, tell me if I'm wrong, but QuickBooks is tied into that, correct, Summer? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Pieces? Yep, QuickBooks is tied into it for our business customers. We also have analysis. All of our banking accounts are under analysis and that's where they separate you know, how much cash is coming in, how many deposits are being made, how many, how many have came in um, automatically, which we call ACH, how many debits are coming out the account. That's when there is a, a breakdown on the account, which is our analysis. And then we also have what we call is treasury management, treasury management services. That's where, like I was telling you, if someone's too busy to come into the office, we have maybe dentists 
dentist offices where they can't come in and they get paid by checks or a lot of the medical fields, they actually get a lot of checks still and they have a ton of checks almost on a daily basis. We set them up with what is called remote deposit. So in the banking, at their office, they're able to run their checks and make their deposits so they don't have to come into the banking center. So it's just based on what you need is how we tie it back to you. And of course there's Pam. <laughs> Pam is our business banker, our small business banker. And she does the lending. She's my lending queen. So she does the lending. But you start with me, you start with your banker, and then we tie everybody else into it. We have a lot of people tend to jump over us and go straight to other avenues of the bank. But sometimes you got to come back to us because that may not be what you need. You may have heard that from someone else, but their level of banking or the level of their company may be different than yours. So you may not be on that treasury management where you don't need that, or you may not need this big payroll company to, or you may not need this payroll service, you can possibly do it yourself. So that's where you come and talk to us and we're able to help you and navigate through what you do, what you do need and what you don't need. So what I hear is if you develop a relationship with your banker, it might save you some money? Yes, <laughs> and time. It's um, headache time. money. <laughs> what an interesting yes. time. All right, cool. So that's enough, <laughs> right? Um, all right, next question. Um, this is a really good question because you just mentioned this, Stacey. Um, how do I develop a financial analysis that will help with healthy company spending needs? With Comerica, ours is built into our accounts. Banks, they're not built into the account. The analysis is charged. It's analysis accounts. Um, for healthy spending needs, it's just, personally, I think that's where you may go back to your CPA because they're able to get that breakdown for you. And they're telling you what you're spending on, what you're not. There is something, some banks do have a built in where you're able to see what you're spending on. And it's just based on what you need and what your goal, what your goals are. Summer, do you have anything to add on that one? Yeah, a lot of it has to deal with uh, kind of what you said, Stacey, where you're at. I mean, if you are a company that can afford a CPA and a bookkeeper, they're going to let you know exactly what, what you need. But if you're not at the point, you're just like it's either one or the other, then choose a CPA and kind of try to figure out the bookkeeping part yourself, but make sure you have the projections. But this is also, as a nonprofit, a great time to bring in your board. Because when you have a board set up, you do that strategic planning at least once a year. And you can see, like we talked about the gap, where are you? What, what, what type of projects are you doing? Where are, where are the funds going? Are they making you money? So you want to make sure that you go towards the money, especially when you're starting. Uh, what's going to bring in, bring in the most money? I understand what sometimes we want to do something due to purpose. Or a lot of nonprofits are set up because it's what they want to do and they want to pre- provide um, where there's lack. And I do understand that, but you still need to make money. So make sure those goals are in line with where, where the money's coming in from and then strategically plan from that point. So um, a lot of it has to do with you until you are large enough where you can have both a CPA and a bookkeeper. Um, but at this point, healthy spending habits has to deal with knowing your numbers, knowing your books, even if you do have a CPA, you still have to know how much money you have. You still have to know where the money's going out because that's where a lot of people get robbed because they have no idea what goes where and they put their trust in other people. So you right. still need to know your own business and your own numbers. I will add to this, ask questions. And if you don't know what to ask, ask the person you're speaking to what questions you should be asking. And if you aren't on it, if you don't trust them, Find somebody else. And I can't stress this enough because there should be a, a, a very clear level of trust with the people that you're working with. Um, and, and I'll tell you a, a, a lovely, a lovely story. Um, no, I won't. We're going to skip the story for now because for a couple of reasons, but what I will share is that, um, if I will second what, what Summer said about getting a CPA, if you have to pick with the person that you need, Get your CPA, no matter the cost, because again, it will cost you more to not have one. It will cost you more if the IRS finds out you've been dipping into stuff that you shouldn't be dipping into. It will cost you more and it may cost your business if you are not, if you are mismanaging your funds. And, and this is, let me take it a step further for the nonprofits in the room. 
you can run the risk of losing, losing your nonprofit status if you don't have these certain things in order. So please go get you a CPA. Um, and again, shop around, ask the questions. And in the other piece, in, in it, again, it's, it's just right in alignment with what we've been saying this entire time. Don't be ashamed for what you don't know. If your area of greatness is not the money side, you need to understand it because you are the leader, the head, the CEO of your, your organization, the founder of your organization, but you can bring on somebody to really do well in that role. So get yeah. clear on where you're gapped um, but, and be able, as Pam mentioned, knowing terminology, you wanna be able to have a, a clear conversation, a conversation that makes sense to you. And you wanna be able to ask your questions to the representatives who you are bringing into your organizations because we don't want to end up finding, okay, wait, where did all my money go? You didn't have the questions. You didn't know where it was going, and you agreed to to something, and now your money is gone. So I definitely wanted to just go ahead and and, and break that down um, a little bit deeper to speak to that, um, because we don't want to leave our people vulnerable, right? And so we're here talking about these really important conversations around finances. Um, and so again, there's there's a lot of people who may have formerly been exposed or may currently be exposed right now, and they're just like, I don't I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get out of the mess that I'm in. And so I wanted to take a second to, to really have that conversation. Um, we have another question. Go ahead, Sharika. Um, you can go ahead and pop yourself off mute. So just to clarify a quick, um, first I do, I've had a CPA from day one. That was the one cost that I think I initially paid out of pocket before my nonprofit officially got started because I didn't know what I was doing. And so she's still on retainer 12 years later. But my other question for I um, for Stacy, you mentioned QuickBooks. Are you saying with your services, you guys give us a subscription to QuickBooks to use, or did I misinterpret that? <laughs> I think we do. I'm not sure. That's why I asked Summer just to make sure are it's compatible with QuickBooks. We're okay. QuickBooks compatible. I'm not quite sure. It does not come with the subscription. However, I I would talk to your CPA. A lot of CPAs for nonprofit depending on whatever your retainer is, it, it typically provides the, the QuickBooks um, yeah. program for it. Yeah, I know they've asked us um, and it's been conversations, but they didn't say anything about getting it to us. So I will uh, double check on that. <laughs> yes, D double check. You've probably been grandfathered and you've been with them for so long. <laughs> They're just like, oh, we decided to do this two years ago, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would, just, I would definitely ask them, but yeah, we're QuickBooks compatible, but we do not have a subscription for it. Okay. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. So we are getting to the final, final part of, of this series or this segment. And so I do have another question, but I just want to, before I ask this last question and we get the answers from Stacy and Pam, if she has shared something to share on this question. Um, but I want to take one last chance to invite you to ask your questions. We're going to go ahead and take um, some of you off mute after, but go ahead and um, if you have questions and you're catching us on Facebook, go ahead and drop those in there. We have somebody managing the Facebook um, to be able to send over those questions. And then again, if you have questions here with us on Zoom, um, we'll, able to pop, we'll be able to pop you off mute, but make sure you either raise your hands or put the question in there so we know you have a question prior to wrapping up. So. Um, one of the questions that we also have, um, because you ladies dropped so much knowledge um, today, if we transfer banks and work with you directly, or if we don't have a bank and we are like, okay, yeah, let me get my whole life together um, and want to start working with you, what does that process look like? It's Pam calling Stacey. <laughs> calling Stacy. That's what I was going to say. Just call me. <laughs> Plain and simple. Plain and simple. There's not, there's not much there. And that's why I want to um, end on that question. If we don't have any more questions, simply because um, we've, we've gone over so much today. We've gone over so many different topics. I mean, we talked um, around myths around business banking. We, uh, we discussed how do we address issues with our banker? What is the role as the banker versus our role as a business owner? We talked about business spending, personal spending, and why we shouldn't commingle. Um, 
and, and there's so many other conversations that we had um, today. Ladies, Summer, go ahead and jump in here too. As we're wrapping up, what is one major takeaway that we that you all want um, our audience to to leave? If they didn't take anything away from the conversation, which we know they did, but if they didn't take anything away, what is one final thing um, that 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 you want to drive home for today's conversation around fundamentals of finance? For me, um, for the small business owners, the people that are just starting up, the first thing you want to do is get your business account set up. That's what I, I really really want to tell everyone, get your business account set up. Do not commingle their fun, those funds and, you know, get everything set up. You, you know, even if it's a sole prop, you can use your social security number. If not, it doesn't take that much right now to get your EIN number and just to get that set up and we can help you with it and we can help you get that account set up. So that's the first thing that all business owners should do. If you're going to go into business, whether if you're, you're um, selling something online, if it's a nonprofit, just get your business account set up. And properly registered with the state of Arizona. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I would say for me, and again, my perspective is solely as a lender, is going to be, please communicate first and foremost in your own mind by setting your goals sharing those with your CPA and your banker, because if you have a goal in the next X amount of years that you do want to own your own office space, you do know that you're going to need a vehicle for delivery. You're going to need a piece of equipment that everybody's on the same page to make sure that you do look like a, for summer's terminology, a business I as a banker want to invest into and help you. So that'd be my takeaway. Yeah. And mine is very similar to Stacy's and Pam's. It is a, a couple. Um, number one, be open with your banker. Be extremely open. They will, so if you give them too much information, they can filter that information and tell whatever story they need to based on the information you gave them consider them your confidant, consider them your trusted source. They're never going to put you in a situation where they are telling the underwriter something that the underwriter doesn't need to know or telling a financial advisor, whatever it is, or your CPA. They're not there to give your information away or put you in a bad position. They're there to make whatever, whatever story you give them or whatever bits of information you give them, they package it up and make a nice bow on it and explain this is why this this business needs lending or this is why this business is such a fantastic business or they call you when uh like a credit card uh program comes out and they say you know what their current credit card is at this rate i know we can get them at a lower rate or let's try and do this they've been they've had a credit card with us for for 12 months and now let's let's get them in a better type of product um and this also lets them resource you out to other companies. So it might not be Comerica Bank. It can easily be other organizations like community development funds that say, yeah, we have $10,000 for a small business that needs it. It's a 24-hour express loan. Here you go. But how would you know that that $10,000 is readily available for you until you speak with someone who, who can get you to the, the person that you need to speak with? So be open with your banker. Tell them what's going on. And they can relay that information to all of their resources based on your benefit. And the second thing I want to speak on is continue to work on your personal credit. I know we didn't touch on it. I know it's not really, it's, it's kind of, it's not a myth. We all know you need good credit to, to get lending, but work on it. it. It's something that is necessary. If you don't know how to work on it, to pull your credit report, take it into Stacy. Like, hey, Stacy, wh what what do I need to fix on this? What can I do? What what advice can you give me? She's been looking at credit reports for 22 years. <laughs> it's not it, it's nothing. She's not going to see anything new on your credit that she's never seen before. So take have that open communication, open conversation. They are your advocate. They will direct you in a in the right path before you. And this might sound bad, but before you open your mouth and talk to the wrong person, give them the wrong information. You want to go through Stacy and your your branch manager so that they know who to send you to to get you what you need right away. So, so your personal credit score in a nonprofit matters too. 
if you're going after so yeah and I guess I and I see that because technically your board is the is the owners of the organization not really you as the CEO executive director so I'm just I just put that out there because that's a shocker for me yeah so your personal score is still it's still based on personal credit so as a as a nonprofit, when you when you went and you did the SBA if anybody did the SBA loan and you put in your social security number <laughs> for that SBA loan or that small business loan during the COVID they they pulled your information when you got the PPP loan, not you specifically, Shriga, but you know, as a, as a business owner, as a nonprofit, they pulled your social security number. They didn't pull your board's number. They pulled yours. They pulled your personal. So it's still based on personal credit. And they, and if, even if they're not utilizing personal credit, they might not use that score, but they want to see how do you manage your credit? How do you, as a person, if you're over a company, how do you manage this, this other side that's supposed to be easier than managing a company? So it's just, it's all part of character as well. Your credit tells more than just a score. Okay, thanks. I'm a little anal, so my credit score is fine, but I was just curious on that. Um, I cleaned my credit up in 2008 when I thought I was going to get laid off. So I made sure it's been, I got scared straight back then. <laughs> <laughs> and that's good. And Shriga, you're, you're quasi government too. So yeah, the government has a lot, a lot to do with being a nonprofit. They do have their hands in it. So your score isn't as reflected, but if you, let's say you want to get bigger and you want to go buy a building for your nonprofit, you're, you're going to use your personal score. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Cause I am looking at the building thing right now. That is a conversation I'm having with uh, others. So that's good to know. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Margo, you're muted. <laughs> I just get so excited, y'all. I just get so excited. Um, I just I do want to add this one point because I don't I haven't really heard anybody talk about on the other side of the um, the SBA loans for for COVID. I've heard you know when they were when they were giving them out or presenting well they weren't giving them out but anyway when they were accepting applications for for them. Um, on the other end, I really hadn't heard anybody talk about oh my goodness I got it and you know this was the process. I did, we did receive it for the nonprofit as well as the for-profit. And it, it goes back to the conversation that we've had today. Pam kind of drove it home in the sense of making sure that you have that future plan. We didn't know how business was gonna affect us. And, and for those of you who, who know what I do in the, the for-profit world, um, I work with a lot of people in the event space. I, I work um, around strategic plan, uh, partnerships. I work with event creation and nonprofit development. A lot of those nonprofits have events or programs that couldn't be put on due to COVID or they had to get postponed or they had to go virtual or what have you. And so things changed and things shifted even for my own conference. And so we said, okay, we need to make sure we're in position. We got people who need to be paid because they have their families. And we just wanted to make sure that we were in a good position. We applied we got it and again we can have that conversation about what what our, my credit look like but it's that conversation of we went to shoot our shot and we just happened to sink it that was it <laughs> right like sometimes it's not more than that and i just wanted to drive that point home because stacy mentioned that from the beginning it's a lot of the one of the biggest myths is simply that they're not asking or they think that they don't qualify or they think that they won't get it and so they don't ask they don't apply so apply, shoot your shot. You don't know what's gonna happen on the other end of that. Um, the, the final takeaway that I wanna share is plain and simple, ask for what you need. Ask for what you need and be prepared um, for the yes. And that's something that Summer and I can tell that story again, maybe one day soon. But again, just be willing to share um, and, and be honest with your banker, develop that relationship with your banker, as Stacey said, um, and just be in position um, for your future growth. So once again, Stacey, Pam, as always, Summer, thank you ladies so much for joining us and imparting so much wisdom that we were able to soak up and soak in today. And, and again, our goal for every conversation, every workshop is to really dive deep in these conversations to take the, the information to be able to apply it to our business right 
now. And if I can say so myself, I feel like we did that. Um, I know that we did that. So again, ladies, thank you so, so very much um, for your time today and for all the wisdom that you shared. Thank you. And if anybody needs my information, Margo, you do have it, correct? Yep. Yep, you all will be getting an email shortly um, with the replay um, or access to the replay as well as Stacy's contact information. Um, Pam, we'll go ahead and um, get your contact information to loop that in as well. And then just as a final point for all of you who are tuning in with us live, as you know, um, thanks again to Comerica Bank not only are we bringing you these 12 bi-weekly series that wrap up in December, but we've also gone ahead um, to put together a nonprofit pitch competition. And so today we, um, again, want to thank you all for joining us, but we want to make sure that you are tuning in with us live um, because um, live on um, Zoom, simply because for those participants who are joining us um, live, you are putting yourself in a great position to be the recipient of a $1,000 cash prize sponsored by Comerica Bank, in addition to a number of other um, training and development resources and some other goodies that are coming from uh, several of our other sponsors. So you can go ahead over to discoverher.org backslash Comerica Business Sense Bootcamp to get all of the details on what is required to apply. And we are going to be opening it up in October to begin submitting um, all of your details and your pitch for the boot camp, um, or sorry, for the nonprofit pitch competition. So we are super, super excited. And once again, thank you so much, Summer, for just seeing the vision, joining us. And for all of you who are looking forward to joining us again, if this was your first time, thanks so much. We pray that you um, really receive some tangible resources to apply to your business. And we look forward to our conversation coming up next. And it's all about systems. So again, thank you so much, ladies, for joining us today for the conversation. We look forward to seeing you next time. Continue making impact. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye.